thank you everybody i hope you had a lovely lunch um we are going to proceed with the rest of the day and we're going to start off with 15 minutes of quick updates where we ask people to speak really fast That's apologies um and then we are going to break out into afternoon breakout groups and all of the options are there so yep sit tight and we're going to start with enabling vulnerable communities to build back better thank you very much Amalia. um can you hear me yeah i think so so i hope you had all had a nice lunch and um i think by this moment of today we all are aware that we uh, really have to act now and that there's really a need to uh yes get started and um as we discussed already this morning, um, one of the ways to go is adaptation, adaptation to the, the impact of hazards. Because as we know, the scale of natural hazards and the people affected is huge. Yeah? Well, these are just some numbers that show the, the worldwide impact of natural hazards on people and especially on the built environment. So um, yeah, I know in this room, there's a lot of people that try to make a positive impact through humanitarian um, technical systems, for example. Yeah, we, we are aware of everything that we uh, developed in, in humanitarian technical systems, leaflet, pamphlets, uh, demonstration houses, and a lot of other things, house door to door assistance. And um, yeah, it is really com complex because every situation is different. There's not a one size uh, fits all solution, but we see that the assistance is insufficiently adapted to the people um, affected. So uh, it is really complex, and we, but we don't really know what makes a difference and there's still a bigger need to explore that so what really makes an impact this is the demonstration house that people use or is it something else and during my phd research i was not sure if i would tell this but sometimes even the humanitarian assistance has a negative impact on the safety of housing um, but yeah I, I suppose some of you are aware of that and and this, that is that really calls for a better understanding of the safe situation of people affected and how we are going to uh, understand uh, what people need in their process. Um, so to understand that, we have to look at this, the system of reconstruction decisions, looking at the disaster, the assistance given, and how this influenced reconstruction decisions, but also how this influenced eventually safer housing, and if this actually has an impact. So um, I really want to understand what is really effective, what is effective, how does this influence the situation? And I will do this for the next four years because I got uh, a research funding uh, to continue on this journey. And um, I separated this in, well, I separated this in two main challenges, understanding the reconstruction decisions and developing a rapid identification. So uh, developing indicators so that you can understand, okay, what is needed in this situation and how can we handle um, rapidly and uh, effectively. And in the first step, I will develop a conceptual framework, developing those indicators, and I hope to do that together uh, with people that have a good understanding of uh, what's happening in the field. So that is my uh, first call. Um, I'm calling for people that want to be, I know we should not call an expert, I want to be people that uh, want to be part of this uh, discussion to develop uh, indicators that we should use to measure the impact of interventions. Um, I'm also looking for case studies where uh, humanitarian organizations are hoping to measure also their own impacts and what is this actually doing on the short term and long term uh, to communities. And um, I'm also looking to build a team for master and bachelor students uh, working on their thesis on this uh, challenge. So if you want, let me know and I will be very happy to work with you. Yeah, I just want to introduce um, a new publication, which is almost there, almost, almost there, um, called Pathways Home Guidance for Shelter Self-Recovery. Pathways Home, that's kind of a working title, but it might well stick. Um, I mean, everybody's heard about self-recovery, I think, at this point, but uh, there hasn't been up until now any guidance. So hopefully this will be a kind of first, first effort to produce some guidance. Um, it's been the work of many, many hands over quite a long time, a couple of years. Um, part of the Global Challenges Research Fund project that I've been working on with various other people, logos on the screen, um, and notab notably Oxford Brookes University send up. Um, just to mention a couple of people, um, Cecilia Schmolzer, um, 
Sonia Molina, Beth Simons, Emma Winstein Sheffield, Sue Webb, all have played a, a huge part in putting this together. Um, and a whole bunch of peer reviewers and other supporters to many to mention. Um, how do I move on? Just the arrow. Yeah. Down arrow. Get used to it. There you go. Um, <clears throat> this, is not, this is not its final format, um, but we got Livia working on the design. But we want it to be um, very accessible, very readable, and useful. Uh, it's going to be in two parts. One will be more explanatory and discursive about self-recovery, and that's part A. Part B is going to be um, more strictly uh, guidance. Um, and uh, it's also full of case studies, which I think is really one of its strengths. I hope it's one of its strengths. Quite short case studies that illustrate what we're talking about. Um, and a lot of tools and links as well. So people can use hyperlinks to zoom about the place. Um, and finally, uh, it's, it's quite long. Um, so we're hoping, well, we, we fully intend to produce a kind of summary version as well, which will be a kind of companion version to it, which will just will be, you know, your sort of constant companion in the field um, and much, much shorter. Um, so that's it. We hope maybe at the Shelter Cluster Week in July, we'll actually have the, f the finished product and possibly even some hard copies. Thanks. That's it. That's it. Fantastic. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, yeah, just two minutes to say essentially that I am here and the HLP AOR, which is part of the protection cluster, but works really closely with the shelter cluster amongst others, um, is, uh, is here to support you in all your HLP related uh, needs. And um, yes, please. And so the shelter cluster has two HLP advisors. Um, so Zibiro, who's been there for a while, and then there's also Patrice, who's joined him, who's currently uh, in Haiti for three months, and Zibiro is going to South Sudan next week. So they're focusing on HLP support for Shelter Cluster. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Sorry. Yes. Housing, land and property. Thank you. Sorry. That's yes. So, yeah, housing, land and property. And it sits with protection, but it actually works with shelter and CCCM. Two key housing, land and property concepts are due diligence, which is asking questions. Who owns this land? Who has rights to access it? How do we make sure it's safe for people to be here? And that's what security of tenure tries to do. Increase that certainty with which people can stay on their land. And of course, many of you do all this already, but we want to say we're here to support further. There's HLP working groups in all of these countries. Red is very established. Green is emerging. Um, some of them are working with shelter. Uh, colleagues some of them are yet to be working as well as they could be with shelter colleagues so if one of those countries is uh, of interest or or you see another country where you'd like to see some more hlp support let me know um we support with technical support so questions around hlp i love to talk about it i love to listen about it ask questions we can connect you with people who are doing really exciting things also can support on the coordination side some of those tricky conversations when there might be agencies who aren't playing as well as they could be um we have a number of thematic groups there you can see on the screen. Would love to have you involved. We're a very open community of practice. There's about 600 on the mailing list, about 100 who are really engaged, but you'd be very welcome to join some of these groups uh, where we try and sort of you know, develop guidance, but also share good practice and, and what's going on uh, and identify sort of like challenges. Um, two things just to mention. We've got some research going on around the use of community land trusts and humanitarian response that we're just sort of like clarifying that was through trust law. They supported us with that. Um, so we'll have something, some sort of events and some stuff around that, which could be really interesting for some of the longer term sort of shelter thinking. And then we've also uh, just I was in the session earlier talking about this. Uh, we're trying to sort of develop better practice that links climate change and uh, and sort of displacement, and housing, land and property. Um, we've got loads of tools and guidance on the website. And there's some contact details. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I am just going to take two minutes to talk about a small research project that I have been working on. Those of you who attended the UK Shelter Forum this time last year, which was fully online, we had a breakout group. So we, Elizabeth Bagerman and Beth Simons, have been working together on uh, shelter and home-based work. Um, we had a breakout group on it at the UK Shelter Forum last year. We were talking about the importance of home-based work um, and housing recovery after disasters and how these two things are intertwined. 
Um, since then, we've been working on a scoping study. We wanted to look at the literature and we wanted to find out what was already known about the relationship between housing and home-based work. So we had two research questions. What are the effects of housing and settlements on home-based work? What are the effects of home-based work on housing and settlements? So what we mean by that is the first question, how is the house affecting the work? Does the house enable it or not? And then what is the effect of the work on the house? What changes are needed to be made to the house as a result of the work? Um, we did a scoping study so we um, identified um, uh, search terms we found lots of documents we narrowed them down we identified 100 no 1837 potentially relevant documents through this big process we narrowed them down to 12 studies in latin america and the caribbean which we chose to focus on so we read those in great detail summarized the um, results and they were very interesting here's what we found Households are more likely to engage in home-based work if they live in advantageous locations within the city, neighbourhood or building, are subject to favourable regulation or lack of regulations, do not feel at risk from natural hazards or security threats, live in larger houses on larger plots with adequate appliances and services, have greater tenure security. We call these characteristics of supportive housing and settlements. And we came up with this natty diagram. What what we realized is that if people live in supportive housing and settlements they're more likely to engage in home-based work and that leads to more sustainable and resilient livelihoods i didn't um it's only an update so i didn't tell you why home-based work is important most uh, most people in the global south in informal settlements are engaging in some level of home-based work a lot of those are women or elderly people or uh, people with disabilities or things like that um they're, they're really important um, and they actually make quite a significant contribution to household incomes so it can be on its own can be really important but also it can be really important as a secondary or tertiary livelihood because that makes you more resilient if you lose your main livelihood you've got other options and then again in recovery so then you might be doing that pre-disaster during disaster, say you're running a shop and you can borrow uh, some of your goods from the shop to help you get over an immediate crisis. You might even lend them to your friends and neighbours um, on credit to help them get over crises. And then when you're bouncing back in recovery, do you rebuild your house first or your livelihood first? What if your house is your livelihood? What if your livelihood is your house? How are you prioritising? It's really important anyway. Um, and we've got a little flyer at the back. And if you want to follow our research, we've now got an academic paper and we're going to go on and research more things. If you want to follow our research, sign up to our mailing list and pick up this little flyer. Thank you. So today I just want to speak very quickly, very quickly about uh, this report that myself and uh, my colleague Holly uh, Segler released late last year, looking at how LGBTQI plus people um, are impacted by recover from the capacity they bring to disasters. For those who don't know, LGBTQI plus is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, and any other non-heterosexual, non-cisgendered person. And our research was really designed to explore kind of current legislative and policy environment for the inclusion of LGBTQI plus people <laughs> within disaster risk reduction. And unfortunately, it's probably not surprising to anyone in this room, we found very, very few examples of policy uh, on a global uh, basis that kind of had any, any uh, engagement with that particular community. In actual fact, we only found six examples um, globally. And of those six, only two were led by national governments, the rest was academia based. Um, and this is a huge problem. Um, LGBTQI plus communities often suffer much higher levels of vulnerability and exposure before, during and after disasters. So we need to do something about this. Um, and unfortunately, this is a, a problem even at the highest levels of DRR policy with the Sendai framework, which is kind of the guidance uh, document that uh, 187 member states signed up to in 2015 to guide how we respond to disasters, has no explicit, explicit mem, uh, mention of gender or sexual minorities within it. And actual fact, it doesn't really include gender, it's a sex-based uh, framework. So we spoke to a number of organizations around the world to understand exactly how we could um, improve policy development, how we could um, you know, recognize the skills and the resources and the capacity that this community can bring to an overall DRR policy framework. Um, and our report, which you can find just on the link just down here, um, provides a number of recommendations that we as policymakers and practitioners 
um, academics, etc., can hopefully do to rectify this so that when the Sendai period comes to an end in 2030, we'll be able to have something that's much better um, and much more inclusive for all members of society. And I think I've actually finished before the alarm, so thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, now we are going into this, uh, this afternoon's breakout groups. Um, you can stay in this room um, where we're going to be exploring opportunities for the shelter sector to become more inclusive and intersectional in its approach to the climate crisis. Um, you can also go back to the rooms across the corridor where one of them is with Amelia looking at technological and digital solutions and one is looking at scaling up the use of low impact materials and technologies. If you're watching online, you can choose to stay with this feed or you can choose the other, follow the other link to the Shelter Projects um, breakout group. And then we'll meet back here at three o'clock. No, three o'clock we break for coffee. Yeah, thank you. Hello all, thanks very much for joining us today. I'm going to introduce our contestants in just a, <laughs> panelists, panelists uh, in, in just a moment. Um, I feel, feel very lucky indeed um, getting to ask experts questions that are of real importance to our overlapping audience of practitioners and academics. Um, I feel kind of an outsider now that, uh, now that I'm working as a donor and, and fit into neither of those categories. Um, but in my role in this chair and, and indeed as a donor, my responsibility is of course to listen and to, to learn. Um, so I'm very lucky to have you here to learn from. Um, in this session, the four of us are going to be seeking to answer two primary questions. The first deals with problems brought on predominantly by exclusion, um, pre-existing uh, issues of marginalization um, and other forms of exclusion. Um, a priori. Then we've got the climate crisis layered on top of that, um, causing both gradual and indeed sudden shocks. Um, this question deals with why inclusion is so important within the humanitarian shelter sector and what we can do. So that's the second part. Well, the second question is about finding solutions to these very specific problems. And of course, within those two questions are going to be uh, in turn subsets. Um, a lot of the last day and certainly a lot of yesterday was a bit more about sort of hard shelter response. What do we actually do with our hands to make things happen? Or indeed, how can we um, share technologies so that other people can do stuff with their hands to be better sheltered? This session is more likely to be looking at the, um, the sort of socio-legal side, the, the enabling environment, guidance and policy, but I, it won't be unduly so on that because I think all of us as practitioners at least have had guidance and policy stacking up and stacking up and there's duplication and very little consolidation to the point where someone new to the sector is dealing with a phone book on, a, on quite a narrow subject and it's a barrier to access. So we want to think what are the ways that we can cut through with some of these messages. So please do keep that in mind as we go forward. So without further ado, um, I'll just say that, hi, I'm, I'm Phil. I'm a humanitarian advisor at FCDO. I work on a range of issues, including shelter, CCCM, Camp Coordination, Camp Management, Housing, Land and Property, LGBTQIA inclusion, and civil military coordination and fire risk reduction. So it's really quite a, a diverse palette that I'm lucky to, to be working on. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's so big. Um, and um, I've got particular interest in humanitarian learning and knowledge management, access negotiation and protection outcomes in conflict settings. Um, Kev, uh, this is Kevin Blanchard and, and I worked uh, or he supported me along with his colleague Holly Segler last summer on a piece that I wrote for the Global Protection Cluster exploring how diverse um, sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions and sexual characteristics influence uh, people's access to housing, land and property rights and indeed to international support. So we'll be drawing a little bit further 
on those themes today, but that, before I go any further, I'm going to start by introducing other participants. Immediate li- immediately on my left is Haley Cap, who is Climate Change and Gender Knowledge Management and Learning Advisor at Care International's Climate Justice Center. She is responsible for developing and coordinating global trainings for development practitioners on climate change adaptation, and as the gender focal point for CARE's climate justice work has conducted various reviews of gender integration in CARE's climate change programming, and most recently delivered a session on no research experience across Africa and Asia in no, I don't think that's how <laughs> no, we, it's no, what meant to say. No, no climate justice without gender justice. You're much better at reading. <laughs> I should have given it to you. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you very much. So yeah, haley has got over eight years of direct project and research experience across Africa and Asia in climate change adaptation, rural development and agriculture, gender, governance and participatory approaches. She has an undergraduate degree in human sciences from UCL, where we're sat today, thanks for the hosting, and an MSc in international development from the London School of Economics. Welcome, Haley. Um, Kevin, next along, is the director of DRR Dynamics, a research organization focused on ensuring the inclusion and empowerment of marginalized groups in disaster risk reduction, or DRR. Kevin has over 16 years experience in developing inclusive DRR policy for national governments, international agencies, and NGOs. Kevin achieved an undergraduate degree in environmental management and a master's degree in environment, politics, and globalization at King's College London. Kevin is an honorary research fellow at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and a visiting lecturer at a number of prestigious universities around the world where he lectures on inclusive disaster risk reduction, emergency management, and climate change. In his spare time, Kevin runs a number of social media accounts on inclusive DRR and no natural disasters. And on my uh, ex- extreme left, um, Maria Kett, Dr. Kett, excuse me, who is Associate Professor in Humanitarianism and Disability in the UCL Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare. An anthropologist by training, she has extensive ex- expertise in disability inclusive humanitarian responses, global health, human rights, climate change, poverty alleviation, and the consequences of social exclusion. Maria has undertaken research in countries across Africa and Asia, leading on a number of research programs on disability and international development, and is author of over 90 publications. She regularly serves as a consultant for numerous bilateral and multilateral donors, including the UK's FCDO, the World Bank, and the United Nations. Um, And something that I've only just learned is that she's also on the steering committee for an ELRA-funded project uh, called Preparing Actionable Data for Inclusive Shelter, which um, seems hugely fitting for today. So that was a long intro. Thank you for bearing with me. I appreciate that. You're still here. Um, (laughs) It felt a lot longer. Um, Does the shelter sector have the capacity to respond? to rising humanitarian needs while reducing vulnerability to longer term shocks and stresses. That's that's been really the theme of today. Um, so I guess let's let's start with the basics. Um, how do different groups of people experience vulnerability or resilience to such shocks? Um, and what does their access to resources look like? I'm gonna pass this to you, Haley. Thanks, Phil. Um, well, as, as we all know, and we've, what we've learned you know, in the sessions so far is that climate change does not affect everybody in the same way, um, does not affect everyone equally. And um, when we look at vulnerable uh, populations and thinking about uh, sort of ge- you know, coming from perspective of gender, thinking about um, women and girls, um, other sort of minority gender groups, there is a um, disproportionate effect on on these um, on them, and there is a double injustice in the sense that gender equality leads to um, poverty, and then climate change on top of that just exacerbates the vulnerability of, you know, for instance, women and girls and other minority gender groups. Um, and so, so, why is this? Um, it all boils down a little bit to social norms and gender norms which exist, and, and these can be very limiting. Um, and 
they can increase the vulnerability of um, different genders, especially women and girls, in three key ways. Um, as I see it, one, limiting access. Uh, and there's a, a, a limit to their access and control over resources. Uh, so, for instance, access to uh, cash transfers or insurance mechanisms, um, also access maybe to decision-making spaces um, where they can sort of shape, I guess, what shelter response might look like. Access to mobile phones, uh, typically in some contexts, women may not have digital um, uh, you know, phones that might be held by uh, the male, male household. Um, and therefore, it may be more limiting in getting um, early warning system messages um, through so they may be delayed in receiving these messages. But then also sometimes these messages are um, delivered in written form. And if, um, if you're illiterate, then you cannot receive these. So. Um, there are a number of ways in which access to uh, uh, to sort of different shelter resources are limited based on uh, gender norms. Um, um, just a few other examples. So um, livelihood loss. So uh, women uh, could often be um, make a living from the land. So when droughts or floods uh, occur, that is a livelihood which is is lost. And with more and more of these uh, extreme events occurring, there's going to be um, more yeah you're going to eat into the the reserves i guess and be, become more vulnerable um and and lastly just yeah you know, when a um say a flood or a, a disaster occurs um you know cultural restraints might, might affect female mobility so um being able to swim or climb trees for instance or um yeah, having permission to leave the home, um, which could often result in staying in the in the home rather than seeking shelter. And then, of course, there's the risk of uh, GBV, uh, gender-based violence, when moving from home into a, a shelter space where there aren't necessary um, sort of divisions or um, your security in place to sort of prevent and you know, keep them safe from potential GBV risks. So those are just I don't want to <laughs> oh, sort of hand over to a. To others, um, but just uh, just quickly, just as an example, in the 2014 earthquake uh, and tsunami um, in Indonesia, in terms of uh, death rates, um, two thirds of those who died were females. So I think this is just quite um, so important to point out that there is a uh, there is a disproportionate effect, and we have to think about what the what the causes of this are, and really think about addressing it in shelter programs. So, <laughs> thank you. Um yeah, it's just, I guess, to kind of build on what Haley has just uh, mentioned, I think one of the things, and I, I've heard it mentioned several times throughout the discussions that I've been part of today, um, the kind of the role of intersectionality and why intersectionality is so important when it comes down to understanding how different people, different groups experience vulnerability and exposure and, resili and how they are able to build resilience or how uh, resilience is taken away from them. Um, and you know, the, the, the question was, Phil, I think if I paraphrase this right, you know, how do different groups experience uh, vulnerability or resilience to such shocks? And I, I don't really think there's an easy answer to that because obviously intersectionality plays such a huge role in how an individual, let alone a, a, an entire group of people, um, are able to respond to a disaster. And I should probably kind of caveat everything that I'm saying today with, I'm not a shelter expert. <laughs> I'm a, um, I, I work purely in disastrous reduction obviously there are uh, huge interlinkages between the two um, areas but um you know the kind of the role of intersectionality is something that we i don't think within the disastrous reduction community anyway and, and this may be different in humanitarian um action really give enough thought to i see phil shaking his head there um but i think what kind of the the overall message i would take away from this would be whatever the you know kind of the shortfalls wherever it is that we're kind of you know missing gaps and and kind of maybe not considering uh groups in in an effective way um you know we we have an opportunity uh to be able to rectify that you know these policies are being developed modified kind of reconsidered um you know all the time and i think it's not too late for us to start examining. I, I was having a conversation the other day with uh, with a colleague, and you know we were talking about this this 
kind of role of how um, you know policy, particularly within this organization, which is a large UN based organization, you know, is developed like 10 years ago. And I'm, I asked the question, well, okay, that, that policy was developed 10 years ago, but how many times have you revisited that policy in those 10 years? And the answer came back, you know, multiple times. Um, and my argument would be, well, there are opportunities in each and every one of those times for us to be able to say, well, okay, you know, society, uh, how we understand society, and um, particularly with uh, sexual and gender uh, uh, minorities, you know, how do we better uh, kind of improve policy um, at kind of a, a very high level? And how does that filter down um, to different communities to be able to, you know, give them the, the, the tools and the knowledge they need to be able to respond appropriately to those vulnerabilities in those shops? Uh, Marie? One's the next question. Don't how is it? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank, thanks, Maria. Um, okay. I mean, we, we, we've been talking about how, uh, how different groups experience um, uh, marginalization in, in, in crisis and so on. Um, did you, was there a particular area that you wanted to focus on at this stage, Maria? Because I'm conscious that you haven't fed into this bit. When we, when we speak about vulnerability and marginalized groups and oftentimes how we identify who those groups are. And I think we very easily, I mean, we've talked about siloing in the sectors, but I think we also silo in the intersectionality. We've got gender, we've got older adults, we've got people with disabilities. And I guess, it, you know, it cuts across all of those things. You know, a person with a disability can be a woman, they can be, you know, of a sexual orientation. Yeah. So how I think we don't necessarily have the tools yet, but I'm prepared to be challenged about this, <laughs> to, to really operationalize that on the ground. And it is nuanced, you know, in some contexts, men with disabilities, or men with a disability will be less marginalized and excluded than a woman without a disability. And, you know, that's really nuanced. And, you know, it, how you understand and interpret that is, is, is really contextual and context-based. And I guess, you know, we've, we've got better at identifying. So we've moved away from medical identification of disability. Hopefully you're all very familiar with the uh, Washington Group short set questions, which base, are based on levels of difficulty, which try to ascertain, um, you know, level of difficulty with seeing, hearing, et cetera. What they aren't doing is giving you a medical diagnosis. And so therefore they don't necessarily tell you, they'll tell you somebody has difficulty seeing. It doesn't you know, it doesn't tell you the next step, you might need more nuance, but it will give you a proxy indicator, right? So there's, we, we've got better at identifying some of those indicators, but I think still we maybe need to push it a little bit. And one of the areas I think, I mean, again, I'm also not such a shelter expert. I don't work on shelter and I work with colleagues in the Global Disability Innovation Hub who are shelter experts, but I think thinking about what, what role protection but specifically social protection can play in this. You know, we know about sort of things like, um, uh, you know, disability allowances and, and thinking about cash transfers, et cetera, and really thinking how they can help those who really are the most marginalized and the most excluded in, in the context that we're working. I think it's really important to try and think about. And just to say at the, at the outset, you know, we don't have, in, in this sector, and I see Leanne's online, hi Leanne, um, we don't have this much, you know, there's very little research actually around the impacts of climate change on people with disabilities, relatively little research. I did some work back for FCDO in 2018, done some more work recently on climate justice. And, in, and really until we did that work, the actual climate sector, UNFCCC, hasn't really engaged with disability as, as an area of exclusion. And that's slightly changing now. There's now hope to get a, a, um, a caucus at the next um, UNFCCC. So hopefully that will start a conversation. But again, you know, you've got indigenous people's group, women's group, people with disabilities, and how do they relate together and, and not become just another tick box exercise, I guess. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I could go on for hours. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a it's a real tricky one when we can see quite widespread levels of exclusion, and so we decide we want to use some shortcuts, and we put some names of particular protected characteristics down on a list, and say try and get some more of them. Basically, I mean that's where we're at, right? Um, but I just want to pick up on the public safety net program thing and challenge you a little bit, if that's okay. Um, because if we extend this a bit further and we look at exclusion on the basis of political affiliation or, uh, or even ethnicity in certain contexts, we see that reflected within beneficiary lists 
right from the host government itself sometimes. Um, how do we approach public safety net program augmentation like shock responsive ones as shelter actors because sometimes that MPCA or you know whatever it is that gets pumped through the PSNP, lots of acronyms, I'm sorry about this, um, but where, where, where money gets put through a governmental assistance program designed to enable additional support during times of crisis, how do we avoid, you know, while respecting sovereignty, how do we avoid marginalization in cases like that? Any thoughts on that? That's a tough one. I'm sorry. Do we supplement? Do do we advocate? I mean, yeah, I think that, you know, it, that is a really huge question, right? And I, you know, I would think there must be agencies on the ground in a completely not the same context, but for example, in Bangladesh, in the Rohingya um, camps, um, people with disabilities aren't entitled to the same level of access as citizens of the country. So things like assistive devices, etc. you know, and, and this is a real challenge because, you know, of course the need is there so how do you bypass that and I guess it's up to NGOs and you know people working in the camps and and in those settings to try and provide those things but, but then you know in the longer term that's not sustainable right so you know it's a really interesting question and I I don't know that I have a, a solution for it maybe you do Kevin <laughs> <laughs> thanks <laughs> uh, no I don't and I, I think if I did uh we probably wouldn't be here. Like if there was a if there was a solution to that, if there was a, a kind of an easy answer, I think a lot of our work would be made much easier. Um, no, I don't, sorry. <laughs> do, do raise your hand at any point if you want to. But, um, oh, Kate, Kate's got her hand up. Do you want to just come up to the mic? That might be the easiest thing. But is that all right? Yeah, please, please, please approach, approach the bench. <laughs> so I'm so happy with this discussion for two reasons. One, um, one of the things I could never articulate about the problem of um, how we described in the humanitarian sector vulnerability, which was just like these categories. One of the problems with that that I could not explain is that it makes the vulnerability seem like it is a property or a belonging to the body of the person instead of recognizing it's the systems around them. And so this really opens that out and I'm really happy. The other thing that I wrestled with, with as well, and it's particularly true to when you're look, looking at urban, sometimes, it's often true in urban areas um, because some of the reasons to migrate to urban areas are to do with sexuality um, is the definition of the household and how um, like households can be intergenerational, households can be mixed tenure, households can be um, friendship groups in urban areas in a way that we don't think about. So I'm really happy to have this discussion. My question is around this enumeration idea. So how, willing are people to self enumerate what happens if you are because we're saying we in the room and we're meaning um humanitarian actors are enumerating people and then therefore exposing them potentially um and uh how willing have you found people are to be enumerated especially if they have the privilege of being able to hide whatever it is they might need to hide I thought a mic drop after that was quite fitting, actually. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess it, I wasn't ready to be questioned, but it's a, it's a, it's a great one. And um, I just bring up my, my dear friend, Mark Deasy, who contributed towards a project um, with Edge Effect and UN Women. And one of the things that he said in terms of, and I'm paraphrasing Mark, so forgive me, but um, in seeking to provide assistance to certain marginalized populations who might be put at further risk by being outed, for example, how can we channel that assistance in a, in a safer way? And his suggestion was to go via 
um, supportive groups, whether in country or uh, regional, where there may be some additional levels of, of persecution. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we can go about approaching such groups and the, the kinds of value that they can bring, whether they be focused on you know, women's support, on sexual orientation, gender identities and expressions and sexual characteristics, um, and, and on disability. Because I know that as a sector, shelter has, has done really quite well, I think, compared to many others, at engaging disability groups and finding out about how we can do better to um, enable them to, to have a, a better quality of life. Because there's a lot of hardscaping in homes that can take place beyond the sort of targeting discussions we've had. But um, Haley, would you mind if I came to you first on how women's groups can help us as shelter practitioners do a better job? Thanks. Sure. Um, yeah, just quickly. So I'm glad this has been raised that working through women's rights organizations is so, so important. And I think something that could be done um, could be strengthened. Um, it's particularly important because um, they will be able, they'll be able to support in identifying um you know could support for instance with beneficiary lists or they'd understand they'd know who in the community was vulnerable and um they would be able to support then the international yeah, shelter effort to identify these individuals as you were saying in a in a safe way because we, they're you know it could even be through in, in order to get input or feedback from these individuals it might need to be anonymous or done through sort of specific feedback mechanisms which are um yeah, safe and secure, and they would be the ones to know how that should be done. Um, the same you know, for LGBTQI plus um, communities as well, where in a lot of contexts, being sort of publicly uh, part of that popular, you know, population would would not be um, is not legal, and therefore would be at risk. So it's important to yeah talk to those who are experts and have the links and know how to do it safely and and learn and work with them on it. Thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, uh, you know, as part of our uh, report that I mentioned earlier, uh, we spoke with a number of organizations all around the world. And one particular organization that really stood out was uh, Blue Diamond Society in Nepal, who do some really excellent work around um, queer populations within Nepal. And after the, I think it was 2011 earthquake, um, they really came, kind of came into their own. They're not an organization that primarily deals with disaster risk reduction or get any kind of humanitarian approach. Um, they're really just a kind of a community organization that's there to support LGBTQI plus people in, in um, Kathmandu primarily, but um, elsewhere in, in Nepal as well. Um, and actually after the earthquake, they found that there were kind of these huge gaps in safety nets, you know, the, 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 the kind of the traditional safety nets that you would approach, you know, if you were um, cisgendered or, or kind of heterosexual, or kind of you didn't identify within that particular community, they didn't exist. So they really kind of just came into their own and, 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 and you know, use the networks, use the information, use the, the, the kind of the knowledge and, and ex expertise they have within that particular area to uh, kind of advocate for, respond to, and, you know, provide for um, people who wouldn't necessarily be able to get um, aid or assistance through other, through other channels. And, you know, I think this is the, this is kind of the, where I think policymakers at kind of national governments and local government levels really do need to make that effort to reach out to organizations that are doing this work already, because there's such a wealth of knowledge out there. And, and, you know, that's why I kind of tend to shy away from the term vulnerable because vulnerable kind of paints everyone as you know victims and waiting to be helped and actually if we look at communities such as the lgbtqi plus community they have awesome networks you know the, 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 as a community you, you know we are really really engaged you know you only need to look at kind of the hiv crisis or the aids crisis to, to kind of really understand how as a community we kind of came forward to to kind of help and 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 you know, really kind of respond where government, where central government was failing. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, in terms of kind of how do community groups have a role to play? Absolutely. I think they're, you know, possibly the most important component, components, particularly within disaster risk reduction and, and kind of crisis response um, to, you know, for, for policymakers, for practitioners to reach out to and engage with in a safe way. And obviously um, that kind of is caveated throughout this entire discussion. Obviously, it needs to be done in a way that's responsible and safe. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously going to say the same. There are organisations of people with disabilities and less, but 
also organisations of older adults. I think perhaps less of those, more, more of the organisations of people with disabilities. But a couple of things I would say is they're often massively underfunded. So then there's a huge expectation that they can provide all this resources help with all these um you know surveys and details and information about people with disabilities yet they're not massively resourced in the first place and when they are invited to things like cluster coordination meetings you know often they 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 you know it's a whole different world and network you know of, of acronyms <laughs> and things that, that haven't you know they don't necessarily have the capacity or understanding to to you know it it's a process to build that up so i think yes absolutely we should be engaging um community groups but i think we should be doing it much earlier and and much more consistently and resourcing them and you know if we're really serious about localization then they, they should be in that agenda hugely they often are the the sort of first point of reference particularly for people with disabilities i would also say that there are often groups within that that don't get included for example mothers or caregivers of children with disabilities sometimes slip through the net because they're not people with disabilities themselves so that that's just a cautionary note and the second thing is how we ask the questions and I come back to the point certainly for disability we try not to ask questions about specific categorizations of, of labels of disability it's about level of difficulty to try and avoid that stigmatization that's not without challenges and and there's lots written about this and I'm very happy to share references but you know to try not to ask those stigmatizing questions in the first place So we, those are some really, uh, really practical things that we can do um, while on mission to to try and get a better under understanding and um, make sure that we are help, helping the folks who need it most. And with um, increasing numbers of people in need of assistance year on year and um, and aid budgets that just aren't keeping up with uh, with that trend. Um, it becomes all the more obvious the the need not to leave people behind, um, the or or to focus on the most vulnerable is what I'm trying to say. Um, ODI put out uh, that's Overseas Development Institute put out a paper which would have been 11 days ago now, um, and said that inclusion is often misunderstood conceptually and operationally by mainstream humanitarian actors. Obviously, not met anyone in this room. A clearer policy framework is needed that positions inclusion as a central element of principled humanitarian action, identifying clear roles and responsibilities, and linking inclusion to existing policies on protection, accountability, affected people, participation, and localization. So, I mean, that's like the most intersectional sentence I've ever heard. Um, so, I mean, I totally agree with it, um, and, I, and I think it's really sound. Um, but moving from sort of practical things that we can do while on mission to to the more policy level at the at the global level, that is, and I've been speaking about governments already with um, with CBM global disability inclusion, joining the board at Sphere um, and a likely increase in mainstreaming and attention to disability inclusion throughout the technical chapters. What specific changes and additions do you think? they ought to be prioritizing and what should we as a shelter sector be asking for in terms of guidance from sphere what are the the technical standards that we feel happy to be sort of governed by or or encouraged to follow to the to the best of our abilities when the donors put up the money um in uh in in the shelter and settlements chapter and what can agencies be doing in advance in practice in order to shape the next edition of that handbook. Um, so yeah, that's a, I think, so I was the disability focal point in the 2010 revision of Sphere standards. And I think, you know, all shout, all credit to Sphere, they have been pretty, you know, pretty solidly, you know, in inclusive about many aspects, particularly disability. And I think, you know, many of you are already aware that there's the age and disability capacity, um, humanitarian inclusion standards, the HIS standards, and there's also the um, all under one roof, the global shelter um, standards for people with disabilities. So there are a lot of technical guidelines, I think. The question I would ask you as the audience is there are a lot of technical guidelines, but as the research that's being done led by the nozzle that you mentioned at the beginning, the preparing actionable data for inclusive shelter led by Alex Robinson at the nozzle and with the Australian Red Cross, I see Leanne on there. It's not being done. So what's the what's the barrier on the ground? You, we've got the standards, we've got the guidance. 
and yet the evidence would suggest that they're not necessarily being used. So I guess my question is back to you as the experts. What are we not doing? What do we need to be doing differently to get those being used more and operationalized and, and actually done? And no one's going to say we shouldn't be inclusive in our shelter, camp management, etc. But the evidence would suggest that it's still not being done. So what 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 do we need to what do you need from us to do it better and differently? I don't know Tom, do you want to come up first? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll pass you the, the mic. Um, so uh, Tom Newby, um, uh, an engineer who used to work in the sector, um, but uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the fact that I'm, I'm back in the private sector. I'm an engineer. I work on very, very complicated projects, uh, big projects. They are at a high level not very different from you know humanitarian projects there are a lot of difficult things a lot of moving parts a lot of conflicting requirements not enough money although more money than in the humanitarian sector the um and when you look at those projects they are done well because there are thousands of specialists involved you've got um so i'm doing a big regeneration project we have an inclusive design team we have several people who are focused on inclusive design. We have flood specialists, we have engineers, we have of many different disciplines. So that, and that's all part of the program. And only, and even then, we don't necessarily do it that well. Um, so I don't have a particularly easy answer here, but because I know that we were talking earlier about the funding being nowhere near big enough. But, but if you really want to make sure that you do the right, we've got to get away from this idea that a generalist humanitarian can do all these things and do them well. A, you need that specialist expertise. Um, and yes, we can rely on some community groups to bring some of that. But as you said, they haven't got the capacity to do all of this stuff for us. So the, there's a bit of a, an intractable problem there that we ask a lot of ourselves in a humanitarian response. And as, as a practitioner who's been in that generalist role there, ultimately when you've got all these different things to do you end up going down the route which is how do i get as much help out to as many people as possible and it's very difficult to then go i'm i'm going to make sure i'm not excluding this group there and that group there and that group there because you just need to keep the thing moving um so i suppose somehow it needs to be made easier to keep the thing moving while not doing that i don't know what the answer the real answer to that is money and specialists, but I, I, I think make finding easy way, another Washington group questions are maybe a good example of trying to, to some extent, dumb it down and simplify it to the point where it can be done without needing lots of time and lots of money is the key thing there. And, and, you know, what's good enough rather than, yeah. Just wanted to say that the IAC Disability Reference Group are moving towards providing disability advisors in, in the same way like the GenCap advisors. So there will hopefully be more of that specialist advice available in the, in the not too distant future. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Steve, I'm from Gloucester. Um, really glad to be here. I'm an advocate for the homeless in Gloucester. So my experience with what you guys have been up to is zero, <laughs> okay? But there is something that I've heard today from you. Um, I'm, and as a layman, I'm just saying it out loud as I, as I, as I think. A, a community builds itself up and you have um, people, coming together and, and, and living side by side, however fragile a, an issue that might be. Then there's a disaster, I, I'm assuming, you know, whether it be ecological or warfare or, or whatever, famine. And then the you come in and I'm, I'm thinking that if, 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 the, if initially, which is the, the, the first help is, uh, accommodation that's fit for purpose, as in, I, when I say accommodation, I, I mean somewhere to, with a roof over your head that's fit for purpose. Um, it might be 
more beneficial so that there's no pragmatism or, or, or they got that and I got haven't got this. And I don't know where what what environments you go into. I'm believe me. Um, but I'm thinking if if we if they come in if we come in with fit for purpose of temporary accommodation rather than stuff that might when it's raining it's coming through which then bring us in or their tent or whatever their, wherever their accommodation is is you know they got that they got and i got this if there was a more of an input possibly i don't know but for suitable proper fit for purpose accommodation perhaps that perhaps being naive them them issues of they have and i haven't are quantified or closed out from the start because it, inevitably what may happen is that these temporary accommodations become permanent accommodations and then that issue becomes even louder sorry but thanks nice one uh thank you very much for that uh, both of you um I guess, uh, I guess, in, in, in response to to your your point, Tom, which is which is really well taken, and I think saying that um, there is a there is a very real risk in being very being so careful with your targeting that you end up slowing down the response to the point where you create wider suffering or you enable the you know continuance of suffering unnecessarily. Um, so I, I guess that it's always gonna it's gonna boil down to almost an ethical question without a real answer, which is like, do you focus on the absolute most vulnerable at the expense of people who can technically survive for for longer, less exposed? Um, and there's no way to know because you're you're never gonna do a um, a uh, you know a double blind test to find out because the ethics of that are even a little bit worse. Um, so, but yeah, I take it. I take your point wholly on that. I, I yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just, right. just one addition to that, I suppose, because I'm taking shame, uh, shameless advantage of having someone from a donor in the room. <laughs> the, but, uh, but I think um, back in the days of Diffid, they Diffid stopped funding small specialist organisations very much some time ago, and I think actually small amounts of budget going to specialist organizations if especially if that can be effectively working with local organizations could go a long way rather than give just giving big bu budgets to big organizations um and and i realize the difficulties of multiple contracts and so on but that would be something that donors could do to unlock some of this i uh you gotta say you're you're preaching to the choir on on that. Um, we'll we'll probably have to pick that up separately from this discussion, but uh, definitely on board with that. Dave, do you want to come up to the mic? Would that be all right? <laughs> Thank you all. Um, hello, Dave again from Shelterbox. Um, so coming at this from someone who's both been in shelter and I have a family member who's um, permanently in a wheelchair. Um, has been for decades so I, I think within shelter a lot we we focus on disability inclusion on the built environment it's about access it's about ramps and doorways and things like this which is great but the social inclusion is a bit different the and you're talking about the sort of networks for for lgbtqia plus communities that doesn't really seem to be the same for persons with disability it's an incredibly isolating thing and there isn't a social network around it in the same way and so how do how do we focus on that sort of social inclusivity and that lack of isolation as well as just the built environment and you know making sure somebody can get through a door or up a set of stairs um how how do us we as shelter practitioners start thinking about things in that way as well no i, I do think that's a really interesting point and i i would i would counter to to a limited extent that in certain contexts there there are very much so disability focused organizations that deliberately get folks with disabilities together and and create the harder spaces to enable um enable that to happen but um as shelter practitioners what do we do beyond that creating those those spaces i'm i'm not sure does anyone else have anything that they can add on that oh, it's, it's
Yeah, so I just wanted to add to say that actually that there is also a link between the physical built environment and that social environment. And we're doing research on the inclusive design in, in the built environment in cities. And a lot of our participants tell us they feel stigmatized by the lack of accessibility in that built environment. And I think the two go hand in hand because if you're able to access the environment, participate in space the same as everyone else, that social interaction, that community will hopefully increase. In terms of integrating that into design standards, technical standards, that's really challenging, which is why we need an inclusive design approach that goes broader than the technical standards. And I think having a specialist that can lead that, carry that, is one of the ways to do that. Um, and I just wanted to add, because we also research about implementation on these things and what the challenges are with the implementation, and one of the things we find is that, yes, to have standards or, or someone that's overseeing inclusive design is needed and important. But if across a project team, there isn't some limited knowledge on why we're doing these things, on why a design would be a certain way, the design intention isn't realized. So you end up with the right design built in the wrong material or you know, small changes that are made in that battle of constraints around resources and, and things that happen as projects get developed, particularly when we have short and urgent timeframes. So having you know, people on the ground that have some basic knowledge of why they're doing what they're doing is also needed. So I'd say kind of in inclusive design, disability inclusion training across the spectrum is also something that, that we would recommend. Thanks very much, Michaela. Nice to hear from you. Um, I guess uh, we're, we're, we've gone through sort of three quarters of this session, and I'm really interested to hear um, about some of the successes that we've seen in this space. And I would I'd really love to hear from the, from the wider uh, group on this as well. I mean, in terms of kind of specific examples of how um gender and sexual minorities have kind of shown uh, a kind of a, 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 a successful example I, I i'm not sure i mean i mean there are countless like there but this is the thing so so the work i've done is kind of looking at a kind of a national international policy framework approach to inclusion of this particular part of the community and there unfortunately there are very few successes like i have seen just a lack of success um <laughs> But uh, kind of recognizing that there are kind of these, these, these community driven groups that are having successes all the time, but also recognizing that we don't want to put too much onus on community group driven groups kind of having to take this forward because, you know, they don't have the funding, as we've said, and they might not have the technical capacities and skills to be able to do that. Um, I don't know. It's, a, it's an odd one. Like for, for me, and as the person who's speaking about uh, kind of queer issues on this panel, I'm not sure I have really a good answer for that. Um, which is really sad and it's a really kind of a it's, it's an indictment of kind of where we are in terms of humanitarian and disaster risk reduction approach that there isn't those kind of really obvious examples of where there are these kind of very clear successes um, outside of kind of community groups driving forward change in their very local localized areas so yeah sorry it's a bit of a downer but um yeah <laughs> So yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to be massively, um, as I said at the beginning, we don't have, where we have good examples is where it's, or reasonably good examples, it's where it's been very targeted specifically for people with disabilities. So projects that have been designed specifically to target people with disabilities, that's great and really welcome. But where we've got very little example, and I checked this with my um, Paddis colleagues, is where it's you know, disability is supposed to be mainstreamed across general shelter projects. And that there we really lack um, good examples. And I guess that's the challenge, right? You know, if we're talking about um, inclusion as a process, it's not just the end product, it's not just the shelter, it's the whole kind of, you know, that really transforming because, you know, it's not just making sure people are included, it's making sure that the, the sort of social norms around the reasons why people are excluded in the first place are also being addressed. That's kind of a huge ask, but, you know, I feel like if the shelter sector or any of the others, it's not just the shelter sector, are really not quite 
getting this mainstreaming right, then, then there's something we need to be doing differently. And so if you have got good examples, I'd love to hear them. I say this in every session and someone will come and give me a good example eventually. Thank you. I think, yeah, most of the most of the good work is happening in sort of research design and um, yeah, occasional stories that you hear from qu quite a long, there's, there's a few, yeah. Um, but uh, I think those, those those have covered most of the the points that I wanted to raise. So if there's anything specific that uh, that you feel that you want to speak to while you while you've got this space on the, on this panel, then then please do. Kevin, just about to launch a report that I think actually has some really kind of valid points on what we've been discussing today, and it's looking at how data um, is. Kind of this area that everyone knows we need better data we need disaggregated data we need data that kind of recognizes uh you know the the diversity of our communities um but there's kind of really very little consideration around how that data is collected well i mean the, maybe the collection part is a different uh, different point but how it's stored uh the kind of the analysis behind it particularly when dealing with marginalized groups and hyper marginalized groups groups where there's kind of a legal barrier to their existence in some countries yeah. um specifically thinking of queer populations uh, in countries where that is illegal or you know culturally um frowned upon um and i you know i, I think a lot of what we've talked about here today um, kind of really does come down to us having better data, us having a, a better system of data collection, a better system of data analysis that allows us to answer some of these big questions, because without that excellent data, you know, without the kind of the disaggregated data that we, we, we should be relying on, um, a lot of the policy development that we're doing at national government level and international organization level really is kind of doing it blind. You know, we don't have the right skills and the uh, and the knowledge to be able to come up with anything useful. Um, so it is kind of, it, so it is a self-promotion in that, yes, I am launching a report in June, but it's also a very, I think, hopefully a valid point more broadly around, you know, one of kind of the overarching themes of, of all of what we've discussed today is we need better data and we need to understand how that data is collected, stored, analyzed, etc. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Tom, did we have any questions in from the chat that we ought to be picking up? No? Okay. No, that's fine. All right. Yeah. Ella, do you, do you want to come up? I think um, uh, I work for an information management organization, so definitely very interested in the, the data collection part. And I think um, Kate mentioned this earlier as well, the whole idea of, of enumeration, um, how willing are people in some contexts, especially when there are legal barriers to self-identify within a survey? And are there good examples of um, research projects, assessments, et cetera, where um, this kind of data has been collected and sort of what are some of the, the lessons learned or standards that, that we can be incorporating in, in collecting that kind of data? Uh, thanks very much for that question. I guess for, for me, the, the, the answer that first comes to mind is the, the only way is up. Um, is, a, is a really great report by uh, published by UN Women, but um, with, with contributions from a range of actors, including Edge Effect out of uh, Melbourne in Australia. Um, Kevin, you may know some others. Can I pass over? Um, so not to give away the recommendations and the kind of the findings of our report, because that's you know kind of cheating. Um, but no, I, unfortunately there, there's, there's kind of a lack of real world examples of where this has been done successfully. And actually what our report has highlighted is that actually this is a really dangerous currently under current kind of systems this is a really kind of um dangerous area uh, that's kind of really uh uh not focused on enough um and actually what we're seeing is you know there's kind of this collection of data particularly in countries where this kind of self-identification particularly if you're a member of the lgbtqi plus community um you know uh unfortunately the world is going in a, in a direction or many countries throughout the world are going in a direction at the moment that's not necessarily conducive to having that kind of respect and um and you know a kind of separation of state and and um you know humanitarian response etc those two things should be very very clear um but unfortunately we, we, we seem to be going the opposite way to that and i think there is no good example currently as far as i'm aware hopefully there'll be someone in the audience that can tell me there is because that would make my 
sleep at night feel much easier. Um, but I think that kind of the key question is um, how we do this and how we come up with standards and internationally recognized standards um, when we don't have policy that even kind of in, in most cases, particularly within disastrous reduction, doesn't even recognize that this is an issue. You know, how are we supposed to collect data on a, on a group that's completely excluded by the Sendai framework, um, which is the kind of the DRR um, framework that the country signed up to. Um, so, so yeah, so sorry, not really an answer, um, but hopefully, you know, next time next year, we'll, we'll have some kind of clearer answers. <laughs> Thanks so much. Elon Cumming, University College London. I'm hearing two lessons. Number one, successful practices. Number two, data. We have many countries where we can talk about this, such as the disunited kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We're doing it. What about New Zealand's COVID response? How are people with disabilities, physical, mental, cognitive dealt with? How are women dealt with? What about the non-heterosexual community? Can we get together a report, a book, some publication from ourselves, our own countries, being open and honest because we're fortunate we can be about successes, failures, those in between. In 2015, I co-edited a book on disability and disaster. The majority, in fact, almost all chapters were people with disabilities in their own words, just writing their experience. We did very light editing. We had some people who could not write. So we, we got them to talk and transcribed it. Some were in Spanish, we translated it. I translated one from Norwegian. And so just getting people to record, write, provide their own words from these perspectives where they can be honest, where it will not harm them, and it's not about good or bad practices, it's just what happened, there's successes, there's failures, but from ourselves and from the countries that we don't typically think about as have having humanitarian response, but yet there was a huge humanitarian response in this country to COVID-19, to the 2013 storm surge. New Zealand has had the Kaikoura earthquake, the Christchurch earthquake, the Christchurch massacre, and COVID-19. Australia has had the 2020, 2021, 2019, 2018, 2017 bushfires um, and floods. So a lot went wrong, but people can speak out or are willing to speak out, just get them to write and let's publish it. Thanks, Elan. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. I think, you know, there are lots of countries in the world where, you know, this is a much easier task. I would just kind of, uh, kind of cool question on one of the points, you know, you, you mentioned the UK there. I'm not sure, I'm sure everyone in this room has seen the kind of the response that the UK government has had to transgender people just recently. And, and I COVID, think, with yeah, and I think that's the big barrier. It's, yes, you know, it, I'm, I'm queer, I'm white, I'm male. I'm in a really privileged position where I'm able to talk about this stuff. Obviously, there are lots of people, particularly with the, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, there are particularly, you know, lots of communities within the UK, within the LGBTQI plus community, who don't currently feel safe in speaking about this stuff. Um, so even in countries where this is, you know, acceptable, um, there are huge hurdles to overcome, even in wealthy, you know, advanced nations. Um, so I, I absolutely 100% take your point, and I, I really like the idea of kind of coming together and doing some research and kind of getting together people's uh, opinions and views. But I think we do have to be careful that we're not kind of um, oversimplifying, or not, not oversimplifying, that's not implying that you're over oversimplifying the argument. You know, we need to kind of think about specific parts of each community within each country and kind of understand how, you know, that can be framed within the within the broader discussion. Uh, I think Kate had a good, <laughs> there's also someone yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say something about data, which is re, the very first point you made about kind of micro uh, biography and autobiography. The sources of data on this are not just counting. Um, there's amazing literature, challenging, critical literature that's come from diaspora communities um, on a lot of, you know, on being a woman and on being queer and on resisting the definitions imposed by us. So I, 
you know, there's just brilliant, brilliant books out there. And I, there is, I read some brilliant ones on like really elderly um, gay women in the UK and their fear of the state and the lives that they had. Um, it's, it matters how old you are and it matters where you've been and it matters what you've read. And we need to, if you wanna know more about it, don't just count people, also read what the outspoken critical theorists in Jordan say, in Lebanon say, I would urge everyone to look for other data in literature. <laughs> no, this is what we need to hear. The fact that Kevin, you and Kate feel comfortable is good. The fact that others don't is not so good. And in our disability and disaster book, we have one chapter where the author is anonymous, not out of fear, they just didn't want their name there and that's fine. But then you have the contacts. If people don't want their name known, we don't use their name. And that's where I need to know that they do have fear, that they don't feel comfortable in this country and how we can move forward. If I hold it back there, is that like, okay? Okay. Um, this goes back a little bit to your question about why isn't there more of this, you know, more focus on this? Why aren't there more examples of success? Um, and I'm. <sighs> I don't know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of I completely missed something in the last sort of 20 years of humanitarianism. You know, isn't this the community, aren't these the communities that we're supposed to be working with? Um, and it made me think, well, what, what is it that, that is stopping that? And maybe it's because at the moment there is a, there's more incentive to say that you're working with more beneficiaries, that you have, um, in a humanitarian response, given a massive amount of funding and covered, you know, millions of, of households, there is no incentive to say we have worked with the absolutely most marginalised people who wouldn't have been able to move themselves forward in this crisis if we hadn't provided this funding. And in some situations that actually might be quite a small number of people, but they would have died otherwise, or they would have been persecuted otherwise. So. I don't know, this might be being a little bit um, extreme, but maybe the way that the humanitarian sector is incentivized, especially in terms of the way it collects data and counts things, has actually really gone astray. You know, this is, these are the marginalized groups that we need to be working with. So maybe one of the solutions is to try and find incentives for donors and implementing partners to be working with these groups. Um, and that's going to involve asking some pretty gnarly questions that we might not want the answers to. But, um, but just to stick up for FCD, I can't believe I'm doing this. They, they do ask. <laughs> it's mandatory now to report on sex, age and disability disaggregated data, as you well know. I think the point, and you really raised it well, is what we do with that data and how we analyze it and how we use it. And that for me is the next bit that we, you know, we, we are getting the data, but are we actually using it and, you know, basing our decisions on the data we collect? So, and whether that's quantitative or qualitative, but yeah, so there you go. You are doing something right. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard that. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I guess, um... I guess we should, we should probably wrap up at this point because we're, we're five minutes over time, but um, it, it does really pose the, the big question. I think we've basically been reformulating the question that Tom put to us earlier, which is, you know, how, how do we deal with the tension between the need that what, it, what is the humanitarian imperative in practice in a sense like, and I don't think we'll answer that today but I will say that we've explored it really quite nicely. Thanks to the three of you and all of the audience participation. So without further ado, I think I'll call this session to a close and with thanks to you all.